Good evening, good evening, good evening, Facebook Live. Uh, excited to have you all on tonight. I have a great topic for you that I am so prepared to discuss with you here tonight, but we're just going to wait just a couple of seconds for people to actually tune in. While you're doing that, I'm just going to grab a couple of things so that we can get our night started. I plan on not being with you for too long just to give you a basic foundation of what we're going to talk about tonight. But before we do, while people are still tuning in, I just want to make a couple of brief announcements, a few commercials. Number one, uh, and I hope I don't get trite as I say this, the book is finally here, The Audacity of Marriage, 10 Principles to Lifelong Partnership. I highly recommend you get your copy. Uh, we have started a huge Facebook group on Facebook, uh, which will be a reading and discussion group for those that are interested in finding out a, a lot more about how they begin to implement these principles into their marriage. So you can go to Amazon.com and get your copy today, or simply go to the audacityofmarriage.com to purchase your copy. Um, also, feel free to download the Couples Academy app on your phone, whether you have an Android or an iPhone. Uh, you can get our latest podcasts and videos and blogs and all the information that we share on a weekly basis to enrich your relationship. Um, exciting news, uh, 2017 is just around the corner and we're preparing for some major things. In February, we will be going to London to do a marriage conference and we're extremely excited about that. So, so all of my, my Londoners or those that have an interest in going, definitely connect with me and I'll give you that information. Also, we'll be going to Antigua. Uh, as well as Toronto. So we're going to be traveling internationally, making impacts on marriages all throughout the world. Tonight, we're talking about a topic that I think is important because as I'm working with many couples, one of the challenges that the hurt partner has in terms of moving forward, in terms of knowing how to get beyond the pain of the affair is the comparison. You know, so tonight we're going to talk about, of all the people in the world, why would my spouse choose him? Why would my spouse choose her? Uh, the hurt partner oftentimes goes through the pain of comparison. You know, will I ever measure up? Am I good enough? What was it about her that you chose her instead of me? How come I came in last place? What was it about him that drew you away uh, that I was, was deficient in or lacking in? And so because of these comparisons, oftentimes it causes us to, to live in pain for a long extended periods of time. And sometimes our partner doesn't do the greatest job of articulating what those details were, because oftentimes we're worrying about hurting our spouse. So if I tell you those details, it may be too much for you to deal with, and so I'd rather you not know. But by me not knowing, it's causing me to not have an understanding, so therefore I can't move forward. So now I'm going to operate in my insecurity, I'm going to operate in a level of deficiency, I'm going to operate in lack, and so because of that, I'm not going to properly heal. Now we may, we may move forward, we may continue to be together in our marriage, but I'm not going to be self-sufficient within myself, sustainable emotionally to be able to live my life the way that I need to live it. So unpacking this is a very <clears throat> good thing for couples to go through when they're trying to restore their marriage. Now, this is the deal. A lot of times a person can choose a partner, but not know why. See, understanding the why means everything. So for the unfaithful partner, they may not know necessarily why, but there was just something about that person. And so what I wanted to do, to decode tonight is something called the dangerous partner profile. That's right, the dangerous partner profile. Because all of us have a dangerous partner profile. So whether you have been involved in infidelity or not, there is a profile. It doesn't mean that there's a living, live, breathing, walking, talking person out there, but there is a profile that all of us are somewhat attracted to uh, based upon personality, based upon features, whatever the case may be. For instance, many people tend to have a type. I like light-skinned women. I like tall men. I like this. I like that. Whatever the case may be. I like Democrats versus Republicans. I like extroverts versus introverts. We all have a type. And so oftentimes when we stay within the box of that type, it causes us to have a natural attractions to certain things. But oftentimes we wind up marrying outside of that type. If you ask most couples who are married, a lot of them will tell you, I didn't marry my type, but there was something different about my spouse and my partner that I fell in love with and it just worked. However, that type may never go away. And so we're gonna identify just a few 
of the details of this dangerous partner profile so that you can have a better understanding of how it may have occurred and what to look out for, what to be mindful of to prevent it from happening again. So in terms of the dangerous partner profile, the first component is what we will call developmental lag. Now let me give you an example of what developmental lag, or in other words, would be relational developmental lag. Let's just use Michael Jackson as an example. Now, I'm sure all of us on this on this Facebook Live are Michael Jackson fans. Now, if you know anything about Michael Jackson, he entered into his career at five. So this man was in show business at a very, very young age. So he missed a lot of his childhood. He was forced to make adult decisions. He was forced to do adult things. He was exposed to an adult environment. So he had to grow up quickly. And so as he uh, grew up in age, he didn't necessarily emotionally mature. That's why when he became old enough to be on his own, what does he do? He built a huge mansion with what? A zoo and a big amusement park in the backyard. He's playing with llamas. He's on roller coasters. And he has this natural affection for children. Not that the man was a pedophile because that was never proven. But he had a natural affection for children because he was robbed of his childhood. So even though, and I'm jumping forward, even though he may have been 30 or 40 or 50 years old, he had an internal age that was young. So he was able to attract to that based upon his lack of development within his own life. Likewise, in a relationship, there's something called relational or relationship developmental lag. And what this simply means is if you're dating someone, as an example, and you've been dating that person for, say, two months, and then two months into the relationship, you engage in sex. But now the length of your relationship is a year. So you've been together for a year. You engage in sex month two. Well, technically, according to relationship developmental lag, your relationship is only two months old. Why? Because the first two months was spent really getting to know each other. Your likes, your dislikes, your interests, your hobbies, your passions. But as soon as sex is brought into the equation, that becomes the main foundation, the main focus, the main form of communication. So you begin to know more about their breasts, their lips, their vaginas, their penises, their thighs, all of their physical body parts, how you can make me feel and how I can make you feel instead of all of the heart issues, the intellectual issues. So we participate in what is called physical or sexual intimacy, but we are void of emotional and intellectual intimacy. Now, when you think about most affairs, most affairs are void of any type of deep, enriched relationship for the most part, unless it's a strong emotional affair. But in most cases, there you're not sharing bills. You don't have any major responsibilities together. All you do is have each other. You're free from the responsibilities of life. So you can have a surface relationship. You can experience a deve developmental lag in an affair relationship, and that is part of the attraction. I can escape from my reality. I can escape from my normal routine, have a good time, have fun, and then go back into my dreaded reality. So the first component of development uh, of the uh, dangerous partner profile is what we would call developmental lag. Now, the second component would be personality styles. Now, nine times out of 10, you married someone who has a different personality style than you because for that particular relationship, it would serve you best. That person represents someone who you could be with long term, but your dangerous partner may have a personality type that would not make for a lifelong relationship, but meets a need at that particular time. So there are many different examples of this that I want to share with you. Like, for instance, if I'm an in introvert, right, but I'm attracted to an extrovert, that is an opposite that I'm attracted to that may represent my dangerous partner profile, but may not be fit enough to be in a long-term committed relationship because the extrovert has certain qualities and attributes and behaviors that may not be conducive for me. Or what if I'm a spender, but I'm attracted to somebody uh, who's a saver. They meet something in me that I don't have, and so that I find attractive because I don't have that. What if I'm a person who's serious and I'm attracted to somebody who's always cracking jokes. That's attractive to me. So these personality types oftentimes are the pull and the draw that binds us together. So when we're entering into a fair relationship, it's not just about the physicality. It's not just about how good someone looks or somebody's body or someone's shape. And to be perfectly honest, when you do the comparison, and I've heard this from countless people, that oftentimes the affair partner, physically speaking, doesn't even match up to the actual spouse. And so that's the first place they go. Well, how does she look? And you know, what 
what kind of body does she have and what his structure is like. But it oftentimes has nothing to do with that. You know, we talked about the internal emotional mood states that people have within them that motivate them to have an affair. Likewise, this is similar. These are internal, what we call dangerous partner profile attractions that we have beyond the exterior that can cause a problem and infidelity creeps in. The third component of the dangerous partner profile are hobbies and interests. Now, once again, if I love tennis, I'm a big tennis enthusiast. I go to Wimbledon. I go to the, um, the uh, what is it, the French Open, the U.S. Open. But my wife just can't, she can't enjoy it. She can't wrap her head around it. She doesn't understand the rules. She doesn't understand the way the game is played. And so as a tennis enthusiast, I also play tennis. So every now and then I go to the gym. And I happen to find a female who's a tennis enthusiast. And so we come together based upon that commonality. And so this natural, normal, platonic uh, interest or activity forms an attraction. And oftentimes when dealing with the opposite sex, when you have a mutual uh, activity that you share where there's common interest, attraction is developed. So what started out as platonic can ultimately become emotional, can become physical, and unfortunately, in many cases, it becomes sexual. So when couples don't have the same interests, if you will, this is what can happen, even when they do share the same interests. So let's just say my wife loves tennis, but I happen to go on a day where she wasn't there, and someone is able to speak to me the way my wife does but they're able to speak to me as well. There's an attraction instantly from the very moment we meet. And that attraction, if I don't have the proper boundaries and borders in my life and in my relationship, can create a vulnerability and an affair can occur. The next thing is what we will call attraction patterns. Now this is deep. Oftentimes the attraction patterns that wind up taking place in a relationship are based upon these opposites once again. So let's just say I come from a household where I didn't have a father, okay? And I'm yearning for a father figure in my life. And the partner that I'm with is more my equal than someone who fulfills the role of my father. I may find a father-like role or figure in another individual and that becomes the attraction because this person represents somebody who can protect me, someone who can provide for me, someone who can cover me, someone who can give me that father-child type of parental relationship that I was lacking in my upbringing within my home. And so this happens in many different regards. Like, for instance, in terms of other types of attraction patterns, let's just say in my relationship, I am not the, initiate, the initiator of sex. But now I get in a relationship, an affair, and I'm the main aggressive one. So I'm switching roles. There's an attraction there that I don't have in my own relationship. And so this oftentimes becomes very painful for the spouse because they're like, well, wow, you didn't do that when we were together. How come in the realm of our relationship, you're acting this way, but outside the relationship, you're something completely different? Well, that attraction that you have for that other person pulls things out of you that you may not have within your existing relationship. So these are things that we've, we've got to consider. Then the next thing is a marital void. So when we talk about marital voids, we're talking about things that represent emptiness within the relationship. And oftentimes that shows up in two ways. There's an emotional disconnect that creates a, an emotional void and we don't participate in what? Recreational companionship, dating, so there's an activity void. And if those two voids exist within the relationship, it creates a vulnerability for something else to happen. And these are the things that we've got to be mindful of. And the last thing, last but not least, as we wrap things up, internal age. Now, I spoke to that briefly earlier, but in essence, all of us have a chronological bio, <coughs> um, biological age. So let's just say I'm 40, but the, the role that I play in my relationship, I feel like a child in my own marriage. I feel like the 12-year-old boy that I was when I was in my parents' home. Well, that internal age drives me away because in my mind, I'm like, I'm a 40-year-old man, but can't be that in my relationship because I feel like I'm a child. I'm going to go out and get somebody who will accommodate my chronological, biological age. Or let's just say I'm 40, but all of the weight, all of the responsibilities, all of the obligations are on me, and I feel like I'm like 55. 
And I just want to feel young again. I just want to feel free again. And I can't get that within the realm of this relationship. But he does it for me or she does it for me. And so that natural attraction speaks to the internal age that I'm feeling on the inside of me. And so the reason why it's important to, to really understand these components of the dangerous partner profile is because it's important to understand the why of the affair. If you don't understand why the affair has occurred, it's bound to happen again. Think about it. If you've ever had a draft in your home, you don't know where this draft is coming from. You just know it's chilly and it feels cold and you're looking at every hole, you're looking at every door, you're looking at every uh, um, seal on the window seal, and you just can't figure it out. And then lo and behold, you find out where the hole is. You find out where the crack is and you close it. And then all of a sudden the temperature changes. Well, this is what this dangerous pro partner profile allows you to do. It allows you to identify what may not be so obvious about these natural internal attractions that you have for a profile type not necessarily a particular person. So it's important for you to identify your own and, your, and for your partner to identify his or her own and for you to discuss it. Well, why? Because this is too painful to discuss. This is not something that I would ever want to share with my partner. Well, you should because it's important, important for your partner to know what your natural attractions are. Why? Because number one, you can figure out what you can begin to do to accommodate in those particular areas, number one. Number two, the dangerous partner profile and all of the components, that becomes your new prayer list. So now I can pray for my spouse with a level of wisdom and understanding that I never had before because I didn't know what was attracting them. I didn't know what the temptation was. But now that I have an awareness, I know how to pray. And number three, I know now what to look out for. So if he likes tall, light-skinned, short-haired women, right, with earrings in their nose, when I see that personality, I know how to respond. I know how to cover. I know how to protect. I know how to get in and, and cause things to situate in a particular way where she never crossed his path. And so it's important to be open and honest about these particular things as you begin to recover. And so if you can begin to do that, the healing will come. The dangerous partner profile. These are critical, critical topics that need to be discussed with your partner. Now, once again, it doesn't necessarily mean that there is a person out there that you should be worried about, but there is a profile that you should be aware of. And the more you begin to know these details, the more intimacy it creates with you and your partner and allows for a more fulfilling relationship. So hopefully this little tidbit was helpful for you. Once again, this is not designed to give you in-depth information, but just to touch on certain points that will edify you. So listen, what I want you to do, share this video on your wall. Share it with those who have been, in, been impacted by infidelity, who are going through, who are looking for answers, who haven't figured things out. For that, her partner, who's living in insecurity, inadequacy, who feels that they can't measure up, who feels like they're less than, this is such a critical thing for them to begin to understand so that they can work on these concepts with their partner to help the restoration process. So once again, I thank you for tuning in. Uh, go and get the book, The Audacity of Marriage. We're going to be starting a huge lecture series on Facebook starting in January, just a couple of weeks away. As we prepare for the holiday seasons, let me just say this in closing. There's so many people who are inboxing me and calling me and emailing me who are going through in their marriage. And oftentimes when we enter into seasonal celebratory times, that's when couples struggle the most. And interestingly enough, December and January are known as divorce months. Knowing that that is the typical pattern that we experience in this country, I want you to fight. I want you to push. I want you to do something you've never done. I want you to pick up a book and read it. I want you to get counseling help. I want you to go to a seminar. I want you to go to a retreat. I want you to do an intensive. I want you to do whatever is necessary for you to do to resurrect your marriage and to make it what it was. You don't have to be a statistic. You can enter into 2007 with a new lease on life a new you, a new marriage, and a new direction. And if we at Couples Academy can be a part of that process, that is what we're committed to. Love you all. See you next week.